Got it. All right. So it looks like we are live streaming on Facebook. It's just loading. So we are recording today's session, but we aren't going to be recording any of our guest spaces. So you don't need to worry about being on camera or anything like that. Um, what I did want to do is just uh, say hello. There's going to be a few voices on today's um, Zoom session. So welcome everybody. Uh, and without further ado, I think we can get started. So uh, thanks everyone for being with us today. Uh, so as we're getting organized, just a couple logistics uh, things for you. We have uh, activated closed captioning. So if that's something you like, uh, you can find the CC button on your Zoom toolbar and either activate or hide subtitles. They're not 100% accurate because they are done automatically through an algorithm, uh, but they hopefully will help you if they are helpful for you. Uh, do at any time either send me a private note if you have any questions or just type them generally in the chat. Uh, and thank you all for helping to make this a welcoming space for everybody. Uh, your video and microphone are off and you can ask questions on Facebook as well. So hello, everybody who's joining us from Facebook. We've got kind of two live streams going on, which is always lots of fun. But what you're here for today is the curious world of seaweed. Uh, we are really excited to have a special BD at home. Uh, we started BD at homes during 2020 as a way to connect with people from home during the pandemic. And it's such a fun way uh, to connect with people all over the world. So we're hoping to continue this as we have special events like we do today. Uh, today with us, uh, we have Josie Islin, uh, the artist behind The Curious World of Seaweed, and you'll get to hear more from her later. Uh, we also have Yukiko Stranger Gailey, who is our exhibits manager here at the Beatty Biodiversity Museum. And here at the museum is myself, Nicole, as well as Vincent, who you'll see on camera later. So lots of wonderful people uh, who are going to be helping you out as we go. As we get started, I do want to acknowledge that uh, the U that UBC, as well as the BD Biodiversity Museum, are located on the tra traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. So we encourage you to dive more into the regions that you're from, and if you feel comfortable sharing which territory you're joining us from today, feel free to add that to the chat. Uh, we're really privileged to get to uh, to get to learn alongside the Musqueam, there's quite a few exhibits in the museum where we explore this relationship and different way of understanding biodiversity around us. So it is such a meaningful acknowledgement uh, for us at the beginning of all of our sessions. We're located in Vancouver, all the way at Point Grey campus. So as west as you can get in Vancouver, uh, centrally located on campus, close to the bookstore, which I do believe you can find Josie's book at uh, today as well. We have a big, beautiful blue whale skeleton outside in our atrium, but that is not the specimen we are going to be talking about today. At the museum, we talk about all sorts of different uh, types of research from ecology, conservation, taxonomy, and we have the history of so many great collections here at the museum. Uh, and we talk about the Biodiversity Research Center as well as so many different ways of understanding biodiversity. I'd like to talk a little bit about the collections because it links so well with Josie's exhibit that we're going to see a little bit later today. So the view on this slide is in our herbarium collection. Many of the algae specimens that are on display, as well as a few from behind me, are from the herbarium collection, which displays plants as well as non-plant things that historically we may have thought were plants, like the algae, fungi, lichen, uh, and I missed one group. No, I think I got them all. <laughs> so we've got all of our wonderful uh, green and pink and red uh, allies that we have living on this planet. The museum is organized into six different biodiversity collections, including the tetrapods, marine invertebrates, or herbarium, entomological collection, fishes, and the fossils. Uh, and we have a variety of different specimens kept in a variety of different ways. So pressed plants and algae, all the way up to taxidermied uh, birds and relatives. If we were going to be going into the herbarium today, you would see some of my favorite, uh, most colorful panels. We've got a couple here that are welcoming you into the herbarium, including this really beautiful uh, display of red seaweeds on the wall closest to you. 
And there's so many special things kept within the herbarium. I would be sad if I didn't share one of my favorites, which is this beautiful uh, seaweed. It's a pressed uh, plant, kind of like the ones I have behind me here. And written onto it is a beautiful little poem. So the curiosity of seaweeds has always been with us as people collecting and photographing and comparing them to what we know in our daily lives. So I think that this exhibit just continues a wonderful legacy of being so excited about these creatures that call our ocean home. When you're in the museum, you can find the Curious World of Seaweed in our uh, Spotlight Exhibit Corner, uh, which has this sort of uh, purple tone on my map here, which may not be showing up so well, but is in the back corner, and we'll do a little walk through it today as well. But you are here to hear from Josie, so to introduce her, I would love to welcome uh, Yukiko Stranger Gailey from our exhibits team uh, to welcome her and throw to her. So I'll turn it to you, Kiko. Thank you so much, Nicole. I appreciate that. And um, welcome to everyone that's here. Uh, we are so excited to have Josie here with us today. Uh, Josie is an extremely talented photographer, author and designer, and her works focus on the forms of nature that we find right around us, right at hand, and in particular at the beach. So I know Josie's newest book, The Curious World of Seaweed, has the same title as the exhibition here at the Beauty Biodiversity Museum. And they both feature these visually rich narratives of our West Coast seaweeds and kelps. Uh, her book has also been shortlisted for the North Carolina Book Award, sorry, North California Book Award, and also the Alice Award. So I wanted to mention that. And her mission is really to produce these enticing, well-researched and well-designed works that combine and, and really live at that intersection of art and science, leaving our visitors with information about and an appreciation for the world around them. Josie holds a BA in Visual and Environmental Studies from Harvard and an MFA from San Francisco State University. And she currently teaches in the School of Design at SFSU. For over 20 years, Josie has been using her flatbed scanner and computer for the generation of this beautiful imagery, part of which you're gonna to see today. And when talking to Josie, we really get a sense of the past, overriding passion she has for uh, really determining and, and synthesizing the scientific stories of our coast and bringing them this thoughtfulness and stewardship to this extraordinary place of discovery, as she calls it. So as I said, I'm really thrilled to welcome Josie here with us today. Um, her exhibition is absolutely beautiful. And I'm so glad that you're going to get a chance to have a walk through and see some of her works. But I'm even more excited for uh, us all to hear a little bit around the background to this exhibition, uh, the process that she works through, and really get a sense of um, the beauty and the detail and the color in her artworks and where this process, where this journey has led her um, and how she's come across on this journey and how we've all landed in this beautiful place where we can appreciate the seaweeds on this coast um, in this amazing uh, exploration of color and life. So I'm gonna hand over to Josie now. I don't wanna hear me talk anymore. I really just wanna hear Josie talk about her beautiful works and exhibition. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kiko. Uh, I am delighted to be here at the BD by I, I'm here in San Francisco, uh, but I am uh, so delighted to have this show up at the BD Biodiversity Museum there in Vancouver on the UBC campus. UBC is such a center for exploration in terms of our seaweeds and kelps of the Pacific coast. I'm going to share um, my screen and just um, give you a little bit of an introduction to the exhibit that we're going to walk through uh, in the actual museum. So I'm going to go actually a little bit more quickly through this than I usually do so that we can actually take the time when we're in the museum with Vincent, who's going to be walking us through. Um, um, so, so this will be kind of a quick uh, introduction, but I've been making images of the marine algae for many years now, probably started in about 2009. And my goal is to bring this aspect to our, to, to the ocean universe out to us kind of more terrestrial based creatures. How can I bring the world of the seaweeds and the very intricate ecology that they represent to um, those of us who don't get to snorkel, who don't get to dive. Uh, and, and these are really, kind of important organisms that have really been overlooked. Their stories have not been as widely told as other, say those um, marine mammals that, that 
seem to get all the attention. Um, as Kiko mentioned, I've been using my flatbed scanner as a camera for many, many years. And uh, this is here in my studio. It's right next to me here. Um, and that, that top portion of the scanner that you see that's open with that white cover, that's actually what's called the transparency adapter. And that has a secondary light source in it so that when the scan is being captured, that top goes down and actually has a second light element that pushes light through the specimen that, that, that lets me capture that incredible translucency and color um, that these transparent seaweeds have. Um, the other thing about this scanner is it lets me scan at a very high resolution. So what I'm creating is an iconography of sorts, an iconography of the seaweeds that lets me design with the images so that they can work in the context of the page of a book, they can work on the walls of a fine art gallery, uh, and they can work in these architectural settings. It lets me have this broad range of how I can, how I can use uh, this imagery. One of my greatest delights is when I get to um, work with scientists themselves. And this was an installation uh, for the Northeast Algal Society's conference a couple of years ago. Uh, and I was asked to come in and do something with the gallery space where they would be having some of their meetings. Uh, so again, um, I work on fabric, I work on paper, uh, and it allows me all these different installation possibilities. Uh, and I got to do a talk in the gallery space for all of the phycologists, those seaweeds, those scientists that study seaweed. Um, and uh, here um, you have the wonderful cytosiphon here, the brown cytosiphon and the botryocladia or sea grapes uh, printed on these tall um, 94 inch tall curtains. So this is what I get to produce, these very straight ahead portraits uh, like you have on the left here. This is erythrophyllum, the rosy red uh, feathery seaweed that's very common on our intertidal zone uh, from San Luis Obispo all the way through Alaska. Uh, this is actually um, the, uh, a, a tattoo on the forearm of the wonderful Patrick Martone who teaches uh, marine botany uh, there at UBC and is um, really a participant in this exhibit as well. And I'll explain that when we get there. Uh, and then I've explored these kind of more collaged, maybe abstracted uh, ways of working with the images, I mean, with the seaweeds. Um, this is the wonderful halosachion or sea sacs. And usually when I'm doing a talk here, I really like to get audiences to think about the intertidal zone where these seaweeds have to find success. They have to make their way in a world that is very, very different than anything that we humans can really wrap our mind around. Uh, the tide comes in and out in six hour cycles. You know, can we even imagine having our atmosphere be kind of sucked out and come back in uh, every once in a while? Um, so these, they, we, they have to deal with the desiccation of low tide of the hot sun and wind um, and that these, these halosachion actually hydrate from within kind of a different strategy. Uh, this is a completely different uh, feel, um, both in color and texture. These feathery glowio siphonias give you a sense of the vast array, the incredible biodiversity uh, that the seaweeds and kelps present to us. Uh, we'll see this in the gallery. It's one of my favorite scans of one of my favorite um, kelps, the feather boa kelp. Very, very common, both up there in, in BC and down here on the Car uh, California coast. Uh, the feather boa kelp is actually doing very well in our warming oceans, so it's just kind of interesting. Um, and we can, we can see more of that. Um, so I've also been exploring different ways to make imagery, and one of those is this uh, historic cyanotype printing. Uh, this uh, was one of the very nascent ways of exploring photography in, in the Victorian era in about 1840, it was emerging. Uh, and there was this wonderful polymath woman named Anna Atkins, who was using cyanotype printing uh, as a way to make imagery of the algae that she was collecting uh, along the British shores. Um, so I decided in her honor to start uh, coating paper with this light sensitive emulsion and making um, uh, cyanotype prints in my backyard. Uh, and then I realized that my scans are actually working in this same historical lineage of what's called nature printing. And nature printing is when a print is made directly from the specimen itself. So it has this historic, this kind of scientific element to it that we're really not, it's not an illustration, it's not a photographic interpretation, it is the specimen itself that's making the image. And that I could kind of create this
Hey, Josie, I think your internet maybe just bumped us off. So if you reshare your slides and unmute yourself, it should be good. Yeah, we just can't quite hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry about that. Oh, the internet, it's all good. <laughs> How does... So... I... Okay, does that seem to be working? Nicole, can, can you give hear me a heads you, up? But it doesn't look like it wants to share your slides quite yet. So let's give it a moment. Oh, there we go. I can see a blue slide with red seaweeds printed on it. Terrific. And we can hear okay. you, fabulous. Okay, great. Well, okay, awesome. Sorry about that. Um, so um, these are these interplays between my contemporary scans and these historic cyanotype prints. Um, and now I'm actually going to, there it goes. Um, so this is another one, this is a Puntiella Californica, which is this really cool red seaweed uh, that has these kind of Mickey Mouse ears. Um, and again, it's this dialogue across time. Um, so I made a book in 2014, published in 2014, An Ocean Garden, The Secret Life of Seaweed, which was uh, really designed using the very straight ahead scanned portraits of the marine algae. And it's, it's kind of a, a, a visual primer on seaweed. It was really where I started writing the science and the history of the science. Uh, but as soon as that book was published, I knew I wanted to go deeper into the stories of individual kelps or seaweeds of our Pacific coast. Um, and I, I wanted to not only tell their natural history, but the history of the science. Um, and I want to acknowledge here that, you know, the, the history of the science can seem is very kind of westward facing and there's all sorts of knowledge and history of knowledge that uh, makes a kind of a, a, a more um, substantial picture and that's something I'm exploring now but the kind of western taxonomy of the seaweeds had this very robust visual component to it. Uh, and that is some of these incredible historical lithographs that I've had the opportunity to either scan or have access to the digitized versions of. And what you see here is my contemporary scans of the agregia or feather boa kelp on um, these lithographs made in 1853 by Franz Josef Ruprecht. Uh, and he was describing five uh, kelps and one seagrass of the California coast. So again, this, this interplay between past and present is very much about kind of the, 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 the vector in time has an arrow on it and that arrow goes off into the future. And one of the questions that really undergirds all of my work is where, where will these organisms be in a future with a very changing ocean, with a warming ocean and a warming climate? So that's kind of a, a, a foundational um, question. What these two images are on, and we'll be able to talk about these a little bit more as we go through the exhibit, um, uh, they are based on uh, the lithographs by Alexander Postels, and he was the naturalist on board a, a, a Russian exploratory expedition in 1829 uh, to Alaska, and he had this incredible affinity for the seaweeds and went back to Russia and made these incredible lithographs published in a publication called Illustraciones Algarum. Um, and this is the image that gave rise to the cover of the book. Uh, this is The Curious World of Seaweed. It was published with Heyday uh, Books over in Berkeley, California. I just had a fabulous time working with their editors, uh, their art director and their designer. Um, I get to kind of design, roughly design the book and then I work with their team uh, to really, they really brought it uh, to life as this beautiful kind of book in the hand to hold. So I hope you all can find uh, find copies of it either through the Beattie Museum or through your local bookstore. Um, so there are 16 um, kelps or seaweeds, uh, 16 chapters, each one really keeping the algae central. Algal, making my stories algal centric is one of my ongoing goals in telling these seaweed stories and making this imagery. Um, and I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna kind of flip through these, these images um, so that we can then get into the gallery and talk about them a little bit more um, as Vincent walks us through. But there again is this incredible array of textures, of colors. Uh, most people when they're on the beach have this, you know, kind of ew factor uh, that I'm trying to, to my, get them to, to say, no, let's look a little bit more closely. Uh, and you see 
all this, these colors of green, red, and brown, uh, which are the three taxonomic groups. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, as we get there. Um, the reds have a, have a blue and a red accessory pigment uh, in their uh, chloroplasts, and those come together in this particular specimen of Masiella to make this incredible purple color. There's a whole chapter in the book on color. Um, this is bull kelp. And bull kelp is um, where my research is going forward um, since the publication or has been going forward and it continues to do so uh, since 20, 2019 when the book came out. Uh, I did a presentation just last week for the Alaka Alliance that was uh, kind of uh, come along with me to, to, to see some of my work in progress. Um, that's all sorts of new work related to bull kelp. So you can find that uh, on the events page of my website. Um, and here are a couple of the spectacular uh, specimens from the University Herbarium here at UC Berkeley. So I had access to these specimens for, um, for telling this story in my work. And what's so cool about being at the BD is to, to be able to see some of their specimens um, that connect to this work as well. Um, UC Berkeley has the collection, it's been the repository for marine algal collections for uh, at least the American kind of lower 48 uh, and, and Alaskan collections. Uh, this is a very mature bull kelp. Um, and when I'm telling this story of the bull kelp, the bull kelp forest, uh, which is the dominant canopy forming uh, kelp forest, uh, there in British Columbia, in Northern California, in Southeast and Western Alaska. I really like to bring in um, the relationship to the sea otter. Um, it's often in, down here in California, the sea otter in Northern California often gets left out of the story. Um, and Edna Fisher was a pioneering uh, biologist who was, who was observing our sea otter down here in California. Um, so here's just some color, um, some treasure. Um, there was a Mrs. J.M. Weeks uh, that um, this Weeksia was named after. Um, this we'll, we'll talk about when we get into the, into the gallery uh, because there's a little section on Postelsia. Um, and this on the left is, is the scan of the cover of what, of what was the um, yearbook of the Minnesota Seaside Station. And the yearbook has this just spectacular um, embossed cover of the postelsia uh, or sea palm that is a very common and very unique kelp uh, that just, um, I think the northern uh, edge of its range is up in British Columbia is Vancouver Island. Um, and I'll talk about uh, more about that in the gallery because there's a wonderful story about Josephine Tilden uh, who, who um, ran the Minnesota Seaside Station. And um, she, there's some beautiful coral and algae uh, that um, I got to collect there. And she includes um, a really some, um, some, S, uh, some lectures that were given by a Japanese um, scientist named Yendo who named right on the top here uh, is what's uh, Coralina Vancouveriensis. And that was collected by Yendo at the Minnesota Seaside Station. And he took it back to Japan and then named uh, that particular coral and algae. Agarum fimbriatum. I have just learned from Kathy Ann Miller, who is really uh, one of the foremost algal taxonomists uh, in the country, that agarum is now neo agarum fimbriatum. And uh, the, the names of these um, species are changing all the time, the genus. So, uh, I have just been updated on agarum. And the, the story I tell in that chapter and which we can go into in the in this, um, gallery is that George Steller collected some agarum when he uh, was, um, was uh, living up on the Amchatka Peninsula and was out on the Bering uh, on the islands, on the Aleutian Islands. And those specimens traveled from the 18, 1720s, traveled across uh, Siberia to the Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg. And those herbarium specimens were found a generation later by um, a seaweed taxonomist named Gamelin. Um, and Gamelin named the seaweed agarum. And then a um, hundred years later, or, or many generations later in the 1840s, 
Alexander Postel's uh, described these with these fantastic lithographs and uh, Ruprecht named them Agarum Gemellini. So that um, story across space and time is where the specimens uh, really um, play a very, very strong role. This is surf grass and eelgrass. These are essential um, ecological drivers to nearshore um, environments. Uh, the surf grass is Phyllospadix uh, scolari, uh, and it really lives out on the wave trounced outer shores. Um, these are these are uh, actually flowering plants that re-evolved back into the nearshore ecologies. And eelgrass or uh, Zostra marina is prevalent uh, throughout the Northern Hemisphere and is um, really grows in calmer bays and estuaries and is enormously important as um, an eco-engineer, a, a creator of habitat, a primary producer, and also as um, carbon sink. So the importance of these kelp forests and eelgrass ecologies for um, carbon sequestration, um, oxygenating nearshore oceans for um, generating habitat for fish populations and all sorts of other uh, populations uh, is really just being recognized in the last few years as so important. And that's why their stories are important. Um, so to get to the gallery, uh, this is the image that opens up the gallery. I'll let us talk about it when we get there. Um, these are five foundational kelp. Um, these are a collection of images that I call Ocean's Edge. And uh, when the pandemic came down, uh, all of my book um, events were canceled. So I went into my studio here and started archiving uh, a lot of the scans that I'd been making. And I realized I could pull them together to create this kind of jungle atmosphere and this richness to portray the richness of our intertidal zone. Um, so these are designed to be very, very big murals over 80 inches wide. Um, and uh, they each have kind of a different flavor. There are three of them, two of which are in the, the gallery space. Uh, the, this one is made with all of these dried specimens. And, um, and then this one was made with predominantly fresh specimens. You could see there's a more sculptural quality to the actual seaweeds, and there's a slightly different palette uh, because they've come straight uh, from the intertidal zone. Uh, just a few other images um, that are just you know, to communicate the incredible uh, lushness and richness of this seaweed world. Um, this is a very, very new image I just made uh, last week, in fact, um, to illustrate uh, this talk that I gave last week um, that really is about my, my ongoing quest chasing kelp, the bull kelp story uh, in all of its layers and nuance and history. Um, and um, this was a, a gallery show um, last year uh, that initiated this uh, Chasing Kelp uh, project. I'm trying all sorts of formats. Um, I had wanted to cast kelp in bronze for a long time. Uh, casting in bronze is very, very expensive. So um, I put a few pennies together and cast a very small, worked with a foundry in Berkeley. Um, but my, my dream would be to be able to design and uh, cast some very large kelp sculpture for a public space so that this organism of the ocean can come out and be experienced by all sorts of, by children playing on it, people sitting on it, people having kind of a tactile, a tactile experience um, with the kelp. So I'm gonna finish there so we can get into the gallery, but please um, be in touch with me. I love, um, you know, join me on Instagram. That's my email. Uh, I hope we have time for questions at the end, but if you have um, more questions, please um, email them to me, um, search around on my website. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing here. Um, and we can go into the gallery. All right, I am here. Um, just let me know when to move. Okay, so Vincent, this is fantastic. Um, uh, this, there's an introductory panel that talks about um, how the images are made that we'll see. And then if we flip around to uh, the initial kelp panels, um, we, this is the, the designed as kind of the 
entryway into, into the exhibit. And these are the five foundational kelp that I was talking about. This work was initially conceived actually as a proposal for some artwork for the, uh, the lobby of the Hastings Law School. And my idea was that the uh, law school with a very uh, robust environmental law program, uh, maybe there should be foundational kelp on view as opposed to something about founding fathers. Um, but that led me to bring these five um, um, kelp species together as you have Costaria costata, as we go, move through them, which is the one on the right. Then we have the Nereocystis or bull kelp. Uh, the middle is Agrigia menziesii or feather boa kelp, and that's a juvenile um, uh, specimen. And then you have um, Laminaria sacellii, which is sometimes known as kombu. So foragers will collect the Laminaria and um, kombu is different um, think different species on different uh, continents, but for our Amer North American kombu, it's this um, laminaria. And then the last, um, the last kelp there is actually a specimen from Maine, and that is Saccharina latissima. And that is the predominant kelp that is used in aquaculture or kelp farming uh, on the East Coast and also in Alaska. Um, so if we move along, I think we go into a section that's really about seaweed color. I tried to cluster the, the um, images um, somewhat around ideas and it's introduced by that image of the three different colored seaweeds of red, green, and brown. And the green seaweeds um, have only chlorophyll in their, um, in their chloroplasts. They are, they're, they're just adamantly green and in fact, the ulva here is the signature seaweed of the green category. The, the red category of seaweed um, has red and blue accessory pigments in their chloroplasts. And those pigments are to collect different wavelengths of light. So the seaweeds underwater, um, different wavelengths than our, you know, we're used to daylight, which is very heavy in the red wavelength, but the wavelengths of light that penetrate um, the water uh, might have different wavelengths. And so those red and blue accessory pigments um, have evolved to collect those different wavelengths of light so that, um, that, that these organisms can still be photosynthesizing efficiently. And then the brown seaweeds, which is here designated by this kind of scrap of what's called macrocystis or giant kelp, have a brown accessory pigment uh, that combine with the chlor chlorophyll to make these um, range of colors that's deep brown or golden or olive colored. So the, these, the, the reds, the greens, and the browns are three evolutionary lineages of the seaweeds. And what the, the, the page that, is, that I've put behind uh, the seaweeds there is a page from uh, one of the publications by William Henry Harvey, who is this wonderful character uh, he was an Irish, an Irishman, um, and he came up with these three designations, these three taxonomic or evolutionary groups of the seaweeds, the reds, the browns, and the greens. Um, and so that having that history um, uh, that, that is connected to him. One of the things I want to say about, about this whole exhibit is that there's this very robust, you'll see that there are no actual captions in the exhibit. So there's this very robust website that goes along with it. And I hope we can put that URL in the chat. Um, so if you're in that space, you can actually use your phone and use the QR code um, and get to the website. And I couldn't be more thrilled with the website as it brings together all this, um, this scientific information and historical information. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we go along. So then, um, we um, see ulva, uh, we talked about that. Um, again, some of these red seaweeds, my scanner can really capture this incredible color uh, red. This uh, little guy here is the Osmundia and um, Microcladia culturae, and it's paired on an image by that guy Gamaline that I mentioned. And he was in 1768, I think he wrote the first 
Historia Fucorum. And so it was the first time that the seaweeds were considered as their own botanical realm. They were kind of at that juncture forth studied as um, not part of kind of the terrestrial um, vascular plant world, but as their own botanical realm to be studied in their own right. Uh, and then if we go to the left, it's a really fun um, overlay of the beautiful erythrophyllum that I met with a the dissertation of a, um, a woman named Wilfred Tress. Wilfred Tress. I, she was a, uh, a master's student at UC Berkeley in the 1890s. Uh, UC Berkeley had a really strong tradition of including women in their um, science departments and otherwise. And um, she was writing about erythrophyllum, Dilicerioides. Um, Oh, Twiss. Her name was Wilfred Twiss. Uh, so I got a hold of her dissertation there, and I paired um, this my scans of um, the erythrophyllum with her dissertation. If we go on to the coralline algae, so the coralline algae are paired here because they, as you can tell from their rosy color, are in the red category of the seaweeds. And the coral and algae do this really interesting thing whereby they actually calcify in their cell walls. So this is a strategy that the coral and algae have evolved to resist herbivory. And herbivory is what happens in the intertidal zone with all those invertebrates um, who have those radula and those rasping teeth that are out there to eat the algae. So think of limpets and chitons and even um, sea urchins, uh, snails, all sorts of snails. These are all herbivores and they eat algae. Um, now the coralline algae by calcifying in their cell walls are creating an armor of sorts. Um, and um, so that is something really different um, than all the other leafy folio seaweeds that put a lot of energy into just robust growth. Uh, so the corallines are tend to be very small uh, and there are two kinds of coral and algae. There's the articulated algae, uh, which grow in these tree-like structures. Um, and then there's the encrusting algae. And so if we go into the case, which is so cool. Oh yeah, so we have the bottle of the encrusting coral and algae there. And that is Kathy, I have to give many, many thanks to Kathy Ann Miller, um, my mentor of sorts and all things algae, whose collection that bottle is from and she, um, let me scan this wonderful example of the encrusting coral and algae encrusting that bottle, which must have been underwater for many years. So from the Beatty's collection, which when we go into the case, we see some of their, now coral and algae is hard to, to um, keep in a herbarium collection because it's not very flat often. So you can see a couple of limpets that often have uh, coral and algae encrusting on it. Um, and you can see some rocks with the in, in coral and algae on it. Um, it's really cool. I think this kind of combination of seeing the, of, of objects from the collection with the images. I also have to point out there's a beautiful specimen of Nereocystis or bull kelp. Um, and we'll get to the bull kelp soon. When you're in the space, of course, you can see when the, when the specimen was collected, where it was collected from because that's all part of why these, these herbarium specimens are so important is that they have all that data with them. Um, wow, it's so cool. Um, so after the Corlin algae, we in fact go on to, oh yes, and there's some, um, a beautiful, what looks like a reproduction, another Corlin bottle, but a reproduction of some of these very, very young juvenile Nereocystis. So the Nereocystis is the bull kelp. Uh, again, the, the dominant canopy forming kelp of British Columbia, Northern California to, to start down here. It actually starts its range down near Monterey, California and uh, dominates the kelp forest all the way up through British Columbia, up through Alaska and into the Aleutian Islands. Um, and it's an annual species. So when it begins its growth and maybe we can move over Vincent to the left. Yeah, here we have our Nereo section of these three images of Nereocystis or bull kelp. So maybe we can just focus on those um, 
yeah, these three, uh, yeah, right there. Um, so when it's very young, Neurocystis starts growth without even any bladder, and this is usually in the springtime. And these are very vulnerable uh, little tiny kelps, but they are propagating in such numbers um, that uh, within the months, they actually grow into these full, very robust um, uh, bull kelp that spread out over the um, ocean surface. Um, so I have one herbarium specimen there, specimen there on the bottom right, which is from the UC collection. Uh, this is actually for sale off my website and the proceeds of the sales of this really beautiful print, which is about yay big, um, go to back to the university herbarium. So um, you can find that on my website. It's a really a great uh, partnership with them and it's really nice to be able to funnel the proceeds off to them. Um, and then up above is uh, just a scan of some of these young, um, young Neriocystis. I was just snorkeling this spring up in um, Mendocino and it was when all the young babies were many rip off to the, the benthos or ocean bottom and are floating up at the surface. And uh, in April up in uh, at Portuguese beach off of Mendocino, there were so many, the baby kelp were everywhere. Um, but on the left, this, this, this kind of ghostly and mature bull kelp that I have combined with Alexander Postel's really spectacular lithograph, um, this was my response to the situation on our north coast of California when I was writing the chapter uh, in, in my book, which was about 2018, 2017, 2018. And this is when the, this, these bull kelp forests, because of a number of factors, were actually transitioning into these, these sea urchin barrens. Basically, the urchin populations had exploded. Uh, some of the, um, the urchin predators had been wiped out uh, by the sea star wasting disease. And the warming ocean events had all led to a huge decimation of the bull kelp on the north coast of California. So this kind of ghost um, is ghost bull kelp was my response to the, to that ongoing ongoing issue. It's very much in the news, um, and there's all sorts of kelp restoration work going on, which um, is a whole nother story uh, that I'm hoping to tell in the future. Um, so so if we move on through the exhibit, we have what became the cover of the book, the Stephanocystis, um, and is actually the scarf that I'm wearing right now. Uh, but Vincent, maybe we go to this group um, that is the Nori group or Pyropia. Yeah, this foursome here. Um, so this is all about Nori or Pyropia. It used to be called Porphyra. And um, I have um, one, a scan of some of it that looks very olivey green. And then I have these Pyropia dancers that are very purple. So this is um, a wide, wide um, genus that has many different species. And it is also known as nori. So this is the nori uh, that is wrapped around your sushi. Uh, it is grown on farms in, um, uh, in Japan uh, and all around the world. Um, and there's a really interesting story about learning the very complex life cycle of the red seaweeds through learning the life cycle of the nori. Uh, and it was um, the research of um, Kathleen Drew Baker, uh, a really fantastically brilliant scientist in uh, England. Um, so her story is in the book. I could go into it. I, <laughs> there's so much to tell. Um, but I think you should keep walking through the exhibit because um, I think there's some beautiful specimens in the case of the pyropia. And you can see how these specimens um, are really have all sorts of they just add this kind of dimension to um, the complex life cycle of the nori because somebody actually collected them, um, kept the data, and then they become part of the database of the herbarium. Um, and so I see some beautiful purple. The purple, so one of the things that's really interesting about the seaweeds and these pigments is that they are very, very sturdy and robust. And these specimens in here could be a hundred years old. And yet this pyropia is still presenting as deeply purple. 
Um, uh, yeah, look at that. And it's so, so it's also only two cells thick. And that's why it has this incredibly fragile, transparent, translucent quality to it. So, so the, the, that incredibly thin layer, every single cell uh, in, this, in this nori is able to capture the photons of sunlight and also uptake the nutrients directly from the ocean. Um, so the seaweeds in general have three requirements for success. One is to hold on to the bottom, to stay in place, and they do that through a hold fast. Uh, two is to collect um, sunlight or photons from sunlight to uh, drive the pathways of photosynthesis or growth. And then the third is um, the accumulation of nutrients, and they do that directly from uh, the seawater. So, with that, we'll move on to- Josie, yeah. before you go on, I had a couple of questions that might be good to ask you right while we're at oh, that cabinet, if sure, that's okay let's with do it. you. Uh, so the first one uh, was asking, so Nori is a red algae question? Yes. Uh, some yep. look red, some olive, some brown, some purple. Would you mind highlighting uh, how we might tell the difference between the reds, browns, and greens? Ah, <laughs> it's- so um, you go to uh, Patrick's seaweed sorter that is right there. <laughs> and so seaweeds are very um, confusing that way in that they don't always present to be kind of the true color. And what was really interesting about that, those very first um, uh, explorations by William Henry Harvey in terms of determining the reds, the browns, and the greens was he did not use their outward morphology uh, to determine their, their category. What he did was he looked through his, you know, much less sophisticated mi microscopes that we have, and he looked at the spores, and he saw that the spores presented these, these colors of super, the, these circles of super color, that no matter which, um, um, nori, nori uh, species you're looking at, which might present in these slightly different colors, um, their spores will be really red. Um, so it's just one of the th great joys and frustrations of being out in the intertidal and learning the um, the seaweeds. One, another trick when you're in the top and you're out exploring and you're wondering whether something is nori or in the red category is that the reds tend to be very stretchy. Um, so a piece of nori, whether it's red or it's brown in color or that olivey green, if it has this give kind of like the fabric that we, you know, um, polyester fabric, <laughs> if, it, if it breaks and is quite brittle, it is probably in the green category or a brown category. It's not in the red. So that's kind of a little clue. Um, and it's part of the, the fun of getting to know the seaweeds is that they're always throwing um, some, uh, um, uh, some challenges at you. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Josie. One quick question, and I'm gonna save one till the end, uh, but in the pressed seaweeds, do you know if they're sealed with anything to preserve them or are they just pressed as is onto their paper? They're pressed as is onto the paper. And the beauty of seaweeds as opposed to vascular plants is that they have um, this, uh, these phycocolloids in their cell walls, which is what keeps them malleable and uh, keeps them from drying out uh, when the tide is low. And they're, they easily dry out and, um, and rehydrate. But the, that stickiness that we all know that seaweeds have actually is very good at sticking them to herbarium paper. So if you take care and, and um, phycologists, people who are seaweed scientists learn this early on is how to make these seaweed pressings, you don't actually need to use anything um, to make them stick to the um, herbarium paper because they have that natural stick as part of them. So it's, it's kind of cool that way. Awesome, thanks so much, Josie. Uh, feel free to take it away and I'll save the other questions until the end. Sure. So now we have Postelsia, which is sea palm. And sea palm is um, just one of these remarkable 
organisms that you can't really believe is real life, but it, it really is. And if you get a chance to go out into the intertidal, we've had these massive low tides recently. Um, it's been the spring, the spring, um, not the, the spring tides or the, the king tides, the super high tides uh, that are accompanied by the super low tides. Uh, this would be the time to go out and see the Postelsia because Postelsia resides out on the most wave crashed um, harsh like environments. They love the dynamics of, of being pounded by waves. Um, and they are called the sea palm. That's a very Western facing name in fact, because um, palm trees are <laughs> from some other part of the world. Um, but they have this very flexible stipe or stem that, that feels the most like the trunk of a tree of, of pretty much any of the kelps or seaweeds around. Um, and if we go to, so, so this is my scans of some of the Postelsia, and then this blue one is this fantastic lithograph from the publication in, uh, from 1853 by Franz Josef Ruprecht. Um, so he was, he's just captured that kind of wildness, and I'm, I'm just trying to, to ride with that. Um, and the, if we go to the cover of the Minnesota Seaside Station, that book uh, is, that is in the case, um, that is a copy that is a copy uh, from the collection of, of Patrick Martone. So thank you, Patrick, for loaning, you know, this very valuable book um, to the exhibit. And you can see this, this um, um, embossment of the Postelsia, it gets pride of place on the cover and is actually made the title of the yearbook of the Minnesota Seaside Station. So there were two issues that were published, one in 1901 and one in 1906. And the woman I mentioned before, um, Josephine Tilden, really used this yearbook of, as a way of compiling the papers that were written by the students and the scientists that she invited that came to the Seaside Station that she founded up on the west coast of Vancouver Island near Port Renfrew. And she uh, would um, voyage uh, by train across the country from the middle of the country from uh, Minnesota where she would bring students and half of them were women, uh, for, were girls. So she brought her students from the Midwest and they would take the train for eight days to Puget Sound and then take a steamer around up the coast to Port Renfrew and then they'd have to hike um, to the actual station. She was in charge of actually not only um, uh, the curriculum, uh, but she was in charge of building a, a dormitory and a laboratory building and a library building and a kitchen. Um, I've been there and tried to find the remnants of it. Um, she uh, invited scientists, as I mentioned, she invited that well-known um, red algal expert from Japan. And she had the foresight to bring the material together into these yearbooks. And how lucky we are that she did, because that's all that's left. Uh, the University of Minnesota reneged on their promise to uh, support the seaside station. So after 1907, she could not support it any longer on her own. Um, so it fell into disrepair. And um, finally, in the 1950s, she sold the property. But it is now a regional park, a British Columbia regional park, and anybody can go. It's a spectacular place. I highly advise. Uh, when the spring tides become really low again, that's a wonderful place to, to go. Um, so if we keep going, I think we get to turn the corner now. We have these two accent pieces on the end of each of the, the wallway panels. And these are again, my kind of amalgams of bringing together this diverse shapes and colors to give a sense of the richness of this intertidal zone. And for me, it's about imparting delight. Um, and, and there's such a delight that the seaweeds and just always continue to bring, um, there's a complexity to their ecologies, um, to the history behind the science. Um, my goal is to become much more knowledgeable about the First Nations and uh, Native American and Native Alaskans relationships to the seaweeds and kelp so that I can have this much broader um, understanding of some of these connections that, that we humans have had uh, to them over time. So if we turn the corner, I think we um, go on to the next wall. And I think we have a couple more minutes. So I'll be really quick. Um, 
But here we address the sea grasses. It's just really important to have the sea grasses that are really in a whole other um, kind of evolutionary line than the, than the seaweed. Um, they are not algae. They are, they are plants that re-evolved back into ocean habitats. Uh, and this image is, I overlaid a scan of some of the eelgrass onto a textbook uh, of marine botany um, by E. Yale Dawson. And E. Yale Dawson is very much of a mentor to me. He died very tragically in 1966. But he tells the story in this image here about how the seeds of the eelgrass are designed with these little wings because they create seeds, they're flowering plants. But those seeds are designed to catch onto the articulated coralline algae. And that gives them a chance to not get washed away with the tide and to put down the roots and the rhizomes. And that's just such a wonderful um, ecological story. So that's um, that. Here's the agarum. Um, again, I'm combining my kind of colored scan uh, with this historical um, uh, image from the very old um, Gamelin Historia Fucorum from 1768. Uh, agarum is colander kelp, it's this holy kelp. Uh, colander kelp is its common name. And it is one of the only uh, seaweeds that actually evolved down both coasts of North America. So you will find it on the East Coast in Maine, you, you find um, agarum, uh, and you also find it in Alaska. Um, I just saw a post by a wonderful um, naturalist on my uh, uh, Instagram feed of Maine seaweeds, um, and they posted a beautiful agarum. Um, and and then we have some more of these combinations where I'm combining my scans with these historical lithographs. Uh, this is rockweed, so Fucus disticus. So rockweed is very, very, very common in the intertidal zone um, in our temperate oceans, both on the West Coast and the East Coast. This is the West Coast version of the rockweed. It's called Fucus disticus. Um, and I've combined it with the Postel's uh, 1840s lithograph. Um, and uh, we will finish up here with the agresia, the feather boa kelp. Um, and again, these are my scans that are just about this. If there is an organism that, that creates a sense of delight, that is so different from anything that we recognize in our world of vascular plants, it is for me um, the agar, I mean the, um, the agresia or feather boa kelp. And when I was first writing the proposal for the book, uh, The Curious World of Seaweed, I wrote an, an essay called Empathy for a Kelp. And my challenge to myself was, could I write uh, and, and illustrate an essay using words and images that made us understand an organism that is, that is living in a world so different from our own? and really has all these strategies that are so far out our, outside of our, our human comfort zone. Um, and so that was part of the proposal and it did lead to um, uh, the book and this is the first chapter of the book, the Agresia chapter. And here you have these fantastic specimens from the collection, again, of juveniles. So you have these, these are juveniles where um, it has these roughly lower leaves uh, or blades as they're called. And then this, this thick upper blade that as it ages turns into a strap of sorts. And it turns into a strap with all these outer um, blades, kind of paddle shaped blades coming off it. So I wanna finish up here so we can get to some more questions. Um, I, I do include some of these combinations of the cyanotypes uh, with my contemporary scans. Um, and I'm very committed to cyanotype printing. We've had very non-sunny weather here um, for what seems like months. So um, at least in my backyard, makes it hard to make cyanotype prints. But uh, I am continuing to, to work to explore this uh, portfolio of work. And then we finish with one of these ocean's edge amalgams uh, that can be, uh, as it is here printed at very large scale. I really love the quality of the wet seaweeds that I can capture with my scanner. It just has this flouncy sculptural quality um, that, um, and, a, and a palette that's this kind of richer, earthier palette. Um, so 
uh, that, that is the fresh, how the seaweeds are when they're fresh. Once they dry, they often uh, turn, um, the seaweeds get much more, the color gets much more intense. So I'd love to finish there and be able to take some questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Josie. And thanks, Vincent, for walking us through the exhibit. I'm going to remove Absolutely. your spotlight. <laughs> awesome. Just so we don't make anyone too, too nauseous walking through anymore. Um, thank you so much, Josie. I had one question in our Zoom chat um, from Sheila. With the printing and printer, how do you manage the three-dimensional aspects of the kelps? Uh, for example, bull kelp versus a one-dimensional really flat one like a nori. Uh, and what about the salt? Does that have a corrosive effect on your printer? Mm. So, um, yeah, so when I showed you that picture of my scanner, I had showed it to you open. And when I have a very either flouncy three-dimensional or, or bulky um, seaweed or kelp, like the bull kelp, um, I can actually put my the top down partially. I don't have to squish it all the way down. And um, I can use, I had a whole series of stones that sit in front of my scanner and they're my helper stones and they actually prop the top of the seaweed um, of the scanner up off of my specimen. Now, often you'll notice with the bull kelp is I will slice off part of the bulb um, so that you can, <clears throat> so that it gets a little bit flatter. Yeah, here they've just literally taken a slice. They've sliced off both of this, ed the, 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 um, the sides of the sphere of the bulb and they've pressed them um, uh, alongside it. What's really amazing when you press bull kelp is that something that has so much mass as a live organism is pressed into this extremely delicate, fragile um, uh, item. So you realize how much, how much water is, is making up this organism. So the salt, so when I scan, one of the beauties of the scanner is that these elements are put on a glass platen, the glass of my scanner. And glass is beautifully enough, very insoluble. It's very tough. So I, um, if you can see, I have a lot of glass cleaner next to my scanner. So all that salty residue, I get to, ooh, excuse me, <laughs> my light <laughs> lost its stickum. Um, uh, you know what, I'm gonna just switch here for a second. Um, my, um, my scanner, I can clean it. Um, so I, I do that. Now my printer, I print this material all through another printer. I don't actually print my work myself. Uh, I've worked with a fine art printer for many, many years um, and they are here in San Francisco. So any of these images and the images in your uh, um, exhibit were all created there in your incredible productions department there at the museum. So I just can't say enough for all of you all. I have to say such a huge thank you. Um, but I do want to say that all of the images in the exhibit on the website are available as fine art prints through my website. Um, so just another a note about this website. It is really robust and it includes, if you dig down into it, um, it includes uh, if we go to resources, perhaps up on the top, um, you can see that there is actually I'm video. change my screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> I shared the wrong thing. <laughs> I'll just talk about it and then we can get there. Um, is that there is actually videos of Patrick in the intertidal zone introducing us to where you might find that particular seaweed that you see in the gallery, uh, where it actually is. In, um, in its native habitat, uh, especially near you, right in British Columbia. So um, if we go to say one of the egregia or um, yeah, we can go to egregia there. Um, you'll see, and Patrick has a little explanation here. He's explaining the holdfast uh, of the egregia or showing a picture of it. Um, so there you have Patrick. Patrick is just so fantastic. I can't wait to get up to British Columbia to actually come visit you and be able to have his classes come through. Um, he's been just such a huge mentor to me in terms of learning the science of the seaweeds. He's an expert in coral and algae uh, and has an enthusiasm for uh, this part of our ocean world that really has brought so many students um, into the marine, marine algal universe.
Yeah, he's a pleasure to chat with about seaweeds, that's for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm just going to um, change my slide one more time. Um, there's so much on that website and I encourage everyone to take a whole bunch of time to really explore it and go deep into it. There's so many links about the book as well as uh, uh, how to uh, order your prints and all of that amazing information from Patrick as well. So I encourage lots of people to go in depth. And, I, and say, I wanna say, can I just say one last thing that it really represents, and I think the Beattie Museum does this so well, this really coming together of art and science and how, um, powerful that can be in terms of bringing a really a broad range uh, of audience into kind of different aspects of our natural world. So I think the, the website is just amazing. So this, you can actually see the specimens on there as well and go in and actually see all the data that goes along with a, a, an herbarium specimen that's very much a part of it. Um, so again, kudos to all you guys. That's awesome. So I've got a couple more questions here, but I also want to acknowledge we've gone a little bit past two o'clock. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, if you have to leave, feel free to. Um, it's been a pleasure having you here. I've got a couple more questions. So uh, we'll kind of wrap up and do a couple quick, uh, quick fire questions, if that's all right with sure. you. Um, but I'll also say people said your images are beautiful. Thank you so much for such a wonderful and lovely presentation. So first quick question, what is the biggest seaweed you've ever scanned? I think probably a big bull kelp. Um, and I remember when I brought, uh, I walked very regularly at a beach here in, in San Francisco called Fort Funston. I brought back a huge, you, bull kelp can get really big. And I brought back a big um, mature bull kelp. And it was at a time when my son was uh, jumped on the tramp. We had a big trampoline in our backyard. So I actually had to use the trampoline to lay out the kelp, which is right outside of my studio. Uh, the, the trampoline was right outside of my studio. So I could, I could kind of start to position it out there. And then it was very goopy and I had to do it in lots of different sections. So big seaweeds I do have to do in sections and either stitch them together or not. Sometimes they don't stitch together and I have to deal with them as kind of separate parts of the whole. Awesome. Uh, and then there was another question, I think Siphonia, I think that's the, the genera, the images in several prints had a rainbow of colors per individual. Uh, was that an artifact of the scanning process or real variation of the colors? Hmm. So, so I think it's Maziella. So there, the, the Maziella is a genus of leafy red seaweed that in the, in the intertidal can have all of this rainbow um, effect. And that is actually an artifact of um, almost like abalone um, nacre of different layers of cortical cells that the light is refracting uh, between. So once you pull it out, have a specimen actually stay rainbowish when it's dry is very, very rare. Um, so my Maziella usually goes deep purple uh, when, it's, when it's dried. Um, and that deep purple is the result of the red and the blue uh, pigments coming together in a very kind of equal way. Um, does that answer it? Yes. Oh, um, the person who asked the question just clarified, it wasn't the mazella, it was a very thin feather siphonia. I think she might've caught one of the specimens that was in there. So we can always chat about it later on the Zoom, um, but that's amazing. I kind of, I didn't really think about the structural color in the seaweeds as much as I think about it in the other specimens. And I know Josie's video is kind of cutting out. So I'm trying to give her a little bit of a break. It's all good. And you'll just have to unmute yourself, Josie. Fabulous. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I know now you, it's the Gloeo siphonia, that very feathery, um, that's a historical specimen. And that was an image. I actually added some layers of color in there. That was kind of me taking artist's license. Um, the Gloeo siphonia is very orange once it's dried. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for clarifying that. 
So I'm going to move through a couple more slides. Thank you all for asking your questions and feel free to, you know, send us a note if you come up with a question later. I want to say thank you to each and every person who joined us today. We really appreciate your support of the museum and thank you for all of those who have contributed to the museum through a donation through registration. Uh, we really do appreciate each and every uh, one of those. Uh, they go right to the museum. So thank you so much. Our next event is going to be in person on not on uh, Thursday, December 16th. We're open late by donation until 8.30 p.m. Uh, so do connect with us on social media, connect with Josie on social media, uh, find the book at your local bookstore or at the BB Museum's shop. There's wonderful uh, prints and more stories online as well. So uh, take some time, get curious about seaweeds. And if you're fortunate enough to be close to the seashore, please do go outside, take a look at these beautiful creatures we share the ocean with. Uh, they are absolutely incredible um, and thank you all all for joining us today uh, and thank you so much Josie is there anything uh, I can is there anything else you'd like to say before I close up for today no but if you are in the area I'm hoping to get up there in February so that we can do some events uh, around the show in person so if you're um, I, I really look forward to that and hopefully all of the world will allow that to happen <laughs> well we do too so thank you so much and we'll see you in the new year